my second part in the history and impact of one of gaming's most influential and impactful titles in Wipeout. If you have not watched part 1, well then now would be a good time, as this video continues on from that and its first two releases across PS1 and the Sega Saturn along with the PC. Are you back so soon? Well then let's continue. the dust had settled on Wipeout's impact, specifically on the PS1, as this was the centre of the world launching on that and PC, with the delayed Saturn release taking the wind out of its impact on that platform to some degree, even to the point that many never even knew it launched on that machine, even to this day, let alone two of them. But more so, the marketing was coordinated with and into Sony's message. But they never interfered with Psygnosis at a micro level, happy to have them as a strategic partner that they just so happened to own. Now after covering how it launched onto the scene of the time, a colossal reason for the game's far-reaching influence originated from its pioneering style, thanks in no small part to the Designers Republic, a design house based in Sheffield. They had more experience in the music scene and edgy album covers and in many ways influenced the intrinsic link the series has had and always will have with music. Bass heavy beats, techno house, trance, drum and bass, they all became as big a part of Wipeout as speed boost, shields and rockets. They worked with the internal design team from the word go, helping to shape the game's unique edgy style from all angles, from the clean typeface and logos to the game's cover and even the UI. It became very popular and emulated with its influence reaching outside the gaming industry and into other areas. Not enough of them to continue though, closing in 2009 due to ye old age old money issues, but the influence lives on as does the title. But they collaborated with the various Wipeout teams multiple times before the closure of the main studio, also fitting in other games such as the original Grand Theft Auto. Now with two titles in the bag across multiple formats including PS1 and Saturn that had differences such as the video sequences being of a much lower quality on the Saturn and running at a slower frame rate, this was largely due to the PS1 having again a dedicated MDEC hardware to decode this in clean 320x240 at 30fps, which was a clear boost over the Sega machine relying just on its CPU alone to decode, in addition to other changes between these which I've already covered in depth back in part 1. Now one thing I wanted to add but did not have evidence or time in the last video was that the original PC release of Wipeout did in fact have a very rare hardware accelerated version release for the then blossoming ATI Rage brand. It was released later and ran at various levels depending on the hardware you had but it looked much closer to its PS1 origins now in this format. Now this was highlighted by viewer Virtual Iceman in my last video with a link to that video that covers the various versions which you can check out in the section below. Now please check it out after watching this one of course. Along with the second title that hit PC and Saturn, it was not the last time we saw a non-PlayStation release, but this time handled in-house by Psygnosis themselves and on no less than the PS1's ultimate rival in Nintendo's N64. Released in 1998, it was already well into the PS1's lifespan and even a year after the N64's release date itself, but accompanying the massively overused 64 titling, Wipeout 64 was the third game in the series and became the very very first exclusive version of the series, ironically not on its owner's hardware, although it was published by Midway. It also brought some other original features with the first to officially support full analog controls, Sega did beat them to this claim with its 3D controller, something that went on to influence many other companies controller designs alone, which alongside the redesigned track layouts making corneas easier or removed entirely, it also delivered the best handling version of the series thus far. The N64 controller was always great for the precise controls needed in this new 3D world and Wipeout benefited from that as much as any other title, including Rumble if you obviously paid for the extra vibes. Now, these were not the only additions, mind. Single machine multiplayer was added common with the console, as this was still a world devoid of online gaming options. The previous PS1 titles only had the option to use the system link for two-player action, which involved two of everything. Not so here, other than the controllers. One N64 and two controllers had you set for two-player action. The additions did not stop here, mind. New weapons in the plasma and power-up orbs, which could also be used for ship-specific options like cloaking, got added, alongside new features that counted the 
amount of ships you could eliminate from the race, laying wait to the eliminator mode that would appear in later titles. All these improvements came alongside the game's seven tracks, with again one hidden, just like previous games. Sadly, some of these were mirrored or reworked versions of the other two games. Some new ones did get added with nice design, flows and views, but this was released only a few months after F-Zero X and alongside its total of six crafts, again one hidden, it was not the only area it lacked compared to Nintendo compatriot. Running at only half that game 60Hz or again here in Europe 50, we get the same 30-25 split we see in many of my retro articles, in addition to a 320x256 resolution. Again we can see that this holds the target with no issues, smooth at all times in all action. It also demonstrates the reason for such sacrifices, with F0X really being a continuation of its Mode 7 rooted Super Nintendo scale and rotation tricks. Tracks are all very bland, flat and lacking scenery and geometry as a whole. It may have far more vehicles, but the track design is not as exciting or challenging, being very open and wide. Some would say required due to the high count of race participants. But Wipeout may be more intimate and have a slower refresh rate, but it feels every bit as fast, with a vast increase in trackside details, views and polygons, in addition to a greater variety of textures across all objects, alpha effects easily making up the gulf in frame rate, with the even more apparent gulf in visual throughput. It made some serious strides in its move from the Saturn and PS1, no longer tied to half-hearted 3D, the N64 was blessed with a full Z buffer in hardware, cutting down on any depth fight issues in addition to allowing full perspective texture correction, so the only swimming textures you see here are in the water and not on the walls. Floating point calculation was also another very welcome and worthy addition, delivering sub-pixel accuracy on the polygon vertices delivering the kind of stability Theresa May can only dream of. Now gone are the jelly-like framework holding up floors, walls and objects, instead replaced with solid and smooth points that roll, twist and turn with the kind of accuracy we have grown accustomed to in all our 3D titles ever since. Not all was a win, mind. The engine's inherent draw distance limit still plagued this version, with pop-in level that was all too common in many titles from the fifth generation. The N64 had a healthy throughput of approximately 160,000 polygons per second, but this all depended on many factors outside of the scope of this video for now. But this base limit combined with the tiny texture cache meant that texture quality, aligned with its other new feature of AA and bilinear filtering, made many of the game's assets quality quite blurry as a result, and Wipeout was no exception. It was what makes the game hard to flag as a sharper or cleaner game than prior releases, but it at least does not suffer many of the issues its older releases do. Effects work on weapons, explosions and particles all look good, and if not better than the other games, with more light sources applied to them including coloured lights. But the Wipeout games have always been about the soundtrack and the music, taking a game bound to a 650 megabyte CD, squeezed into a 6 megabyte cartridge, the licensed tracks and brilliant work from Psygnosis Long Term of Cold Storage, aka Timothy Wright, would be lost to this smaller format, which sadly did happen, but not due to these compression reasons. Nine tracks made it into the game from the likes of Fluke and Propellerheads, but the bulk came from Mark Lord and Rob Bandola. These MIDI files compressed into this tiny space is the reason this is one of the few cartridge games to have loading times. Now this is the point when these tracks are being decompressed ready to play, and they did a great job of keeping the Wipeout Audio Delights as good as its disc based Origins. With its grunge techno music, fast racing action, improved combat, tighter controls and rock solid performance, the N64 release of Wipeout was and is a great addition to the series. It had new ideas, if not a revolution of older games, it was an improvement, something the next game in the series was equally, if not more, guilty of. Damn it, you almost bad. Wipeout, or Wipeout 3, came right at the end of the machine it was born on.
The PS2 was already being shown and talked about, Dreamcast was already out and these machines had started to look dated. But Studio Leeds took the reins for this last hurrah over the Liverpool studio and wanted to make a swan song for the machine that looked more like a PS2 game than a PS1 game in just nine months. Now this small schedule was helped by taking a development version of Wipeout 2097 and then building from this. Much of these improvements came from the mature dev tools and optimised methods that five years of iteration across multiple teams will yield. Sony had started to ship detailed code and performance monitoring software to help teams maximise the hardware. Studio Leads put this to good use in addition to a rarely used mode on the PlayStation. It's high-res widescreen mode boosting the game's resolution to 512 by 256 nearly double the width of the previous titles and it benefits the game's aesthetics greatly in addition to the palette changes to made to the game to make it brighter and cleaner than earlier games. DR returned to redesign the logos, fonts and UI again and all of these errors combined to create a more grown up and believable future. The shift in tone is immediately evident and became the base that future games would build on. Well, bar one. The game added refinement and additions rather than any great changes. A two-player split-screen mode was now added to the PS1 for the first time. System Link could still boost this to four players. The improvements made by the team's rendering engineer Pete Bratchter worked wonders to deliver a game that could now render two views at the same resolution as previous titles, along with rewriting portions of Sony Japan's own rendering code to reduce the clipping and seaming issues I covered in depth in my last video. The game's cleaner assets, sharper textures and image quality aligned with this more accurate vertex movement and texture mapping achieved its aim of looking much closer to an early PS2 title than a PS1. Some sacrifices came from a reduction in ship lod within the camera view to deliver all these increases and improvements and that also came with its performance. It not only looked better but had more effects added such as billboard light shafts, a rendered cockpit, increased trackside scenery but it also returned the first game's locked 30 stroke 25 FPS in both single player and multiplayer races with split screen. Putting the two games side by side, the leap in hardware utilisation is both dramatic and impressive, but the team really knew how to handle the hardware and make it sync. Now sadly Cold Storage was not back for the ride, instead DJ Sasha was given the job of working with all artists so that the game's soundtrack all fitted into a theme more like a movie than a collection of licensed tracks. It was another success with a varied selection of bombastic tracks that fueled the races and speed with an ever bigger contribution list with the likes of the Chemical Brothers and Paul Van Dyke to name two, all added to the audio delight. Elimination mode and weapons from Wipeout 64 also got added into the mix to expand the game's options. The special edition released here in Europe that has all this footage here is taken from had a total of 22 tracks, including remastered circuits from Wipeout and 2097, joined with some prototype layouts that only had flat shading taken from the Japanese release, making it by far the largest selection in any title to date. Wrapped up with a new replay mode that had to be retrofitted to the 2097 engine, although far from painless and without issues due to the game's physics and AI contributing to these problems, it is a worthy addition but still left many with the taste it was more a refined collection rather than a new game outright. Analog controls, ship handling and physics all make the game much easier to pick up and play, with later tracks ramping up the curve, but as fitting and impressive as it was to the series and machine it was created on, it also marked the worst sales so far for the series, as we waved bye bye to the PS. On the machine that would go on to become the world's most successful console of all time, Studio Liverpool, now officially retitled, had been working on a new Wipeout title fit for this new generation, one that was a fusion of ideas, which was fitting for the title. Launched a few years into the console's life cycle and being the only direct PS2 title made, these signals pointed towards the slowing impact and thirst for the game. Being overly compared to F-Zero had taken its toll on this game and the team, 
some of them even losing faith and direction with it. This showed in the game's track design and more aggressive move into action and wider tracks. This is the only game to show vehicle damage as you race and it makes for the toughest game yet to stay through a championship run. Enemy AI was far more aggressive, accurate and hell-bent on taking you out. Races now feel much closer to F-Zero in nature. Tracks have more obvious shortcuts and other sections to enable a variety of choices across laps. Full loop-the-loop -loop roller coaster designs and a wider selection of weapons join the new ship customization option, allowing you to spend points on improving your ship's speed, handling, shields across season or multiple seasons. But this game is tough. On medium or hard in certain ships, it's pretty much impossible to get to the end of the race. As was introduced in the second title, you can only recover ship shields by driving through the pits. This was dropped after this title, instead allowing you to absorb weapons for shield power instead, which really would have made this game much more enjoyable. The game feels the odd one out of the series, controls are not as smooth or refined, track design is repetitive and clearly F-Zero influenced it greatly, and it centers much more on attack than racing skills, losing some of its focus, for me at least. Upgrades, new modes and music are all good and it helped still feel within the DNA and we should also thank it for introducing the zone mode to series albeit without the trance effects that would appear in the later PSP release. Now visually it was good but not incredible game by the host machine standard. It was the first console release to leap up to 60 or 50 FPS and without the huge overdraw and bandwidth machine it swamped the screen with alpha effects in explosions, dust, particles and transparency with zero detriment to the performance levels. Even split screen two player action made no difference at all to that rate with it never dropping below its target line and on that score it is the high point thus far of the series. In addition to the doubling up of the frame rates, it also improved the draw distance now due to the high polygon pushing power of the PS2. It didn't suffer like the PS1, so therefore no popping at all and high texture quality alpha effects which the machine is very common for, along with the lack of mitmaps. So you see a lot of textures in the distance shimmering which is common for the PS2's look. It stands alone in the Wipeout franchise as being an offshoot in all areas and as such is largely forgotten by many, something demonstrated by it being the only PS2 release aside the later ported PSP second title Impulse, and it stands as my personal low point of the franchise. With Sony cemented in the home console market as top dog, it set its sights on the handheld market owned by Nintendo, and although the PSP was a huge success, shifting around 80 million units in its lifetime, it never shook it to the extent of its home goals. Nintendo stayed king across every generation, even though Sony got the closest, it was still a distant second place. The Wipeout team helped the machine land many of those sales with two titles that hit the handheld. The first Pure was released in 2005 alongside the handheld itself and set 100 years after 2097 with the design returned more to the Wipeout 3 and away from the fusion layout. Track design uses a great mix of chicanes, swooping corners, long straights and inclines to show off the engine and speed. They all flow well and work to highlight each ship's strengths and weaknesses. Absorbing weapons was now part of the game, making races far more tactical and removing the pit power up. Zone mode as we know it now had the trance style introduced as you just concentrated on the turns as it all gets progressively faster. Music is again a good mix of heavy beats and electronic bleeps. Development took around two years and was managed by a team of approximately 20 led by Dave Burrow and involved creating many aspects of the engine from scratch. This included AI, physics and the level design UI which was converted over to XML, speeding up the development process as time was of the essence to hit that launch window. This allowed programmers to concentrate on core engine code and the designers to alter the game without them. Other improvements also came with the team's Maya tools being improved to allow track designs to be iterated for testing within five minutes rather than hours, a key factor in them hitting that tight launch window. It also had DLC to show off the PSP's online capabilities whilst moving into the increased revenue path we are now in, as they squeezed as much onto the game's disc as possible. This included eight teams with a collection of free DLC tracks, skins and music being released over the first few months, even including cold storage tracks returning from the first two games. 
It's a great showcase for the hardware, running at a target 30 FPS, but with VSync disengaged, it tears across the vertical portion of the screen to keep refresh and response as high as possible. And by the look of it, it works, feeling very smooth and responsive in both cockpit and third person views. A clean look with Gurud shading and textures combined deliver a very PS2 looking title that sold well on the handheld, shifting over half a million units within its launch window and more beyond. Now, performance is not the game's highest point, and the lack of V-Sync was something that would persist into other titles. Much of this is due to the relative high poly count in the game, with its specs quoting around half the PS2's max rate of 33 million polygons per second. But just like that machine, this was a very false and theoretical maximum. It was most likely chugging around 50,000 in most games, and here with its target 30Hz rate. And like both titles on the PSP, it ran at the standard 480 by 272 resolution, so it gave it a little bit more headroom than a standard PS2 title, most likely in PAL running at 720x576 in interlaced mode. You could also force progressive if you wanted to, but not all titles support that as well. Controls are good, but the flat analog stick of the PSP can make steering stiff at times, as your thumb is overworked to move the stick as smooth as possible, much harder with its flat design. And also, the small nature of the machine itself can create controller claw if you have bigger hands like me, so after an hour or so with the top triggers, it can set in. But playing with the controller options can improve this to a certain level though. It achieved the target of launching with the machine, demonstrating its power and impressing all that played it, finally giving us wiper action on the go. This was followed up in 2007 with Pulse and then later on the PS2 port in 2009. Now sadly I have lost my PSP copy and I didn't pick this up on the PS2 so what you see on screen here is the game running under emulation using PCSX2 which obviously has faults on shadow ships and textures so I cannot really cover this in my technical analysis sadly. But it did port well to the PS2 here running at 50 FPS, it runs obviously at 30 on the PSP and allowing a 16x9 or a 4x3 mode mode, custom music tracks and a huge selection of licensed techno musicians were included with German heroes craftwork added to the Wipeout bow. Many modes returned with Zone but it never sold as well as hoped. Some of this was the fact it, again, was a refined and improved version of Pure. They tried to mix up the tracks and alter the difficulty, the AI is much tougher and on hard, as you see here, just getting 6th or 7th is an achievement in and of itself. The PS2 version was enhanced over the PSP's release, but it was more about maximising return on development and aside these visual enhancements and all the DLC, it was exactly the same game as the handheld release. in between this update that a new Wipeout title would land again on a brand new machine. Showing the signs of cost cutting and lack of sales, this PS3 release would be digital only and came two years into its release and brought all the content, ships and tracks from the previous two PSP releases, but now in glorious 1080p and 60fps. This game only existed because of programmer Andrew Jones, who had worked on the PSP titles and was keen to show just what those games would or could look like running at twice the frame rate. It impressed all and was signed off to become yet another benchmark for the team and the PS3. 
It would later receive an update pack Fury that added in more modes and pushed the game more into combat and ramped up the visual quality and pyrotechnics. The PS3 was still suffering at the time, with titles underperforming on it compared to the Xbox 360, so having a full HD game was a big thing at the time. The clue is literally in the title and more so at 60 FPS. It was a big tech showpiece for the machine. The team had been used throughout its history for this exact reason. Even though it lacked much new content, it did enhance it over the handheld release as the on-screen examples show from the PSP or the PS2. This was a dramatic improvement worthy of the HD tag indeed. The team really tried to push the machine and engine as far as they could and they achieved a showcase for the system. Being tied to the PSP assets but not the hardware saw a vast uplift in all areas, texture resolution, alpha effects and particles, lighting, they all got increased over the PSP. Polygon models went from a few thousand per ship to 30,000 at maximum lot. Trackside detail went into the millions. Even though the routes are clear on the tracks from its handheld base, they are substantially better in all aspects in this new HD world, as was the frame rate. Now the aim was to utilize the benefits of the PS3 at the highest levels possible and to achieve this they also wanted to not waste GPU cycles, which is best achieved with a dynamic resolution. And that's exactly what they did. They kept the vertical at 1080 at all times, but they scaled the horizontal between two points, 1280 at its lowest and a full 1920 when the fill rate gets too much. This is done every 32 pixels, giving us exactly 21 possible resolutions across the X axis. Backing this up with an adaptive V-Sync allowing the screen to tear as needed if the 16 millisecond render budget is missed, giving a torn or partial frame at the next refresh rate. Now the game actually tears 100% of the time, with the V-blank stage being missed and out of time on every single frame, giving a torn section at the top of the screen. Now to avoid this, you have to ignore the top 25 pixels, which I've done in my analysis here, which only represent the tears that extend beyond that small section. Like some other PS3 titles such as Gran Turismo, it uses the machine's output resolution to alter the games, a 720p output drops the dynamic nature of the title in favour of adding 2 times MSAA, but it still has the lower IQ of the two options with similar performance. And it's very close to its target 60 FPS. It tends to tear for a second or so and is mostly down to fill rate effects like Alpha Explosions, Bloom or the Doff Pass. Collisions with other ships can also cause some tears, but it rarely drops below the high 50s. It can at times, but only in heavy action. And it never feels anything but responsive. Bounding box collisions are run on the PS3's SPUs along with many other things as these had to be done to make up for the relative GPU weakness. Many teams like Santa Monica and Naughty Dog as here with Studio Liverpool became very adept at filling in the blanks, mixing workloads up and allowing them to work in tandem with the PPE and the GPU. But the bounding boxes actually have some issues. You can see here as I slow it down, the collision between the physical vertices and the ones you can't see are actually far wider, hence you're cl crashing into a ship that you're actually quite a few pixels away from. From great use of reflection maps, clean diffuse tones, image based lighting and high specular all make the game very impressive to look at. Helped by its high resolution on the machine, it stands out as a very sharp title indeed. In fact, the exact same resolution as the recent PS4 Omega collection, although not at all times. A limitation of the ship design and obviously being aligned to the axis. Revisiting it now for this video, I can still appreciate the talent and artistry on show here as the team really truly maxed out the machine and delivered by far the best looking and performing title in the series. Well, well until this week. One final game would be made before the team's sad closure. It was another one that linked them with the launch of new hardware, and this time they played a direct part in just what the PS Vita would become. Working closely with Sony Japan, they had direct input into the machine specs, control, and the dual analog stick design was a direct result of the team's involvement, along with using their code directly on the prototype machines and compilers. Wipeout was a symbiotic creation with the Vita itself, one could not exist without the other. 
Another impressive piece of code and art it was yet again. Even though the Vita excelled at delivering full home console quality in your hands before any other machine, games such as Uncharted Golden Abyss from Ben Studio, now getting ready for its latest PS4 release in Days Gone, stands out as a technical showcase for it. Wipeout is as equally as impressive and demonstrative of the combined quad-core ARM CPU and PowerVR SGX graphics SOC that powers the machine and paralleled the PS4's development process using less bespoke hardware but still having some custom features within its 45 nanometer design. It was a handheld machine that could deliver PS3 level quality and all better. Something demonstrated with this very game that runs the exact same shader code as its PS3 HD Fury Origins in addition to taking all that SPU workload back onto the PowerVR GPU. Not bad for the little machine that could but it does have to make some sacrifices to its bigger brother. Resolution is one, dropping from a native 1920x1080 down to the machine's resolution of 960x544. And just like the PS3, this can also dynamically adjust down if the load becomes too high and the render time of 33 milliseconds is missed. Now this is normally following a V-Sync being dropped to try and keep response high and then is all resumed back to its native rendering and V-Sync on the 30fps target. Aside these two sacrifices, it also has some improvements. Due to the newer GPU, HDR light is now of a higher resolution and thus quality, as are reflections which, like other assets, benefit from a 4x MSA pass to sharpen up those edges. For a launch title, it was not pulling any punches in pushing the machine hard. Multiple light sources come from trackside lights, weapons that have point lights illuminating anything within range, smoke plumes, bloom, video playback on trackside boards, something which is missing from the recent remastered collection I may add. Texture quality and geometry are almost a match for the PS3 base it came from. The game is every bit a wipeout game. Track design is very strong with multiple routes through them. A flowing design makes the learning curve easier and the dual sticks of the machine, beautiful OLED screen, make it a joy to both play and watch. The on-screen footage here does come from the PS TV, which is almost a Vita without a screen, but you must take into account the screen it was intended for, and as such, it should be played on the handheld for the best visual quality, which was my preferred method of play before the latest remasters landed this week that I covered earlier in the week. Sadly, it was not enough to save the studio or team, and only a few months after the Vita and game shipped, the team was informed by Sony management that it was to close. This was a very, very sad day for the team, myself, and I'm sure many of you watching this video. For a studio that smashed into the gaming scene in the 80s, building up its name, stature and skills on the 16-bit Commodore Amiga Mega Drive, before creating one of the most recognised franchises and an icon within the gaming landscape. They contributed to a large part of my gaming years as well as the Sony Empire, delivering something new and fresh that transcended the gaming landscape. They mixed pop culture with games to achieve huge success, iconic status across multiple generations, shaping the the hardware and influencing the community as they went. It has been a privilege to step over the years of a company that achieved the highest level of success and left us with a legacy that we can still enjoy as much now as the day I stumbled into it in a pod in a tent. Rave on, Psygnosis, party on, Studio Liverpool, but always be sure to never wipe out.